According to Thomas J. Bernard and Megan Curlycheck, there was considerable effort in the 1990s to reduce the jurisdiction of the juvenile courts and to process more and more juveniles in the adult system. Many states passed statutory exclusion laws which automatically transferred juveniles to adult courts under certain circumstances. For example, depending on the state, if a juvenile was at least 14 or 15 years old and he or she committed an especially violent type of offense, then depending on whatever the law would say, he or she could be automatically transferred to the adult court by way of statutory exclusion law. And it actually got to the point in some states where um, there was no sort of a hearing at all and what would happen is that there would be an offense and they would look at the individual's age. Sometimes they might look at his or her prior offenses if the state law had anything to say about that and then just whatever the individual had it would be processed either as an adult or as a juvenile and there would not be the presentation of any types of mit mitigating circumstances of any kind. Um, of course again all of this is going to vary depending on the state but statutory exclusion laws eliminate the need for a waiver hearing. I think that's what you really need to know. Um, and the authors argue that currently 37 states within the U.S. still maintain some form of statutory exclusion. Besides statutory exclusion laws, prosecutors also can waive a juvenile to an adult court by way of something that's known as a direct file. As with statutory exclusion laws, a direct file does not involve a waiver hearing. In other words, a juvenile defendant can be transferred to an adult court without any type of hearing. No deliberation. Rather, he just goes or she just goes straight to an adult court. Interestingly, Bernard and Curlycheck contend that a juvenile may be interrogated and even waive his or her rights to an attorney before the district attorney even lets the juvenile know that he or she tends to file directly in the adult court. Um, and this can be very difficult, especially a child may be encouraged by his or her parent to waive their Miranda rights because the parent thinks, well, this person's going to be, you know, tried in a juvenile court anyway. So this is withheld from the juvenile and from the parent in most cases. Meanwhile, the juvenile is in there talking with the police, giving up all kinds of information that can later be used, not in a juvenile court, but in an adult court. Um, this is also consistent with the writings of Barry Feld, someone who uh, you'll definitely become acquainted with. Um, in the second edition of his book, Juvenile Justice Administration, The Nutshell, Feld also discusses this manner by which states have enacted laws to simplify the transfer of youths to criminal courts. And Feld, like Bernard and Curlycheck, asserts that statutory changes limited judicial discretion and were used to guide prosecutorial charging decisions. If you see here, we have a, a cartoon of juvenile, the juvenile death penalty, and it's, it's funny. It says, Mommy uh, said we're dead if we take the cat swimming with us, but I happen to know the Supreme Court barred the executions of minors. And that's exactly what the Roper versus Simmons case was all about. Um, Bernard and Curly Check examine juveniles and the death penalty, and also Simon Singer, in his article, Sentencing Juveniles to Life in Prison, explores this topic as well. The case of Roper v. Simmons was a U.S. Supreme Court decision 
where the U.S. held that it was unconstitutional to execute someone or to impose the death penalty on offenders who were under the age of 18 when their crimes were committed. It is worth pointing out that this was a 5-4 decision. So the justices were extremely split in this case. And in his article, Simon Singer also points to a very recent U.S. Supreme Court case, which is Graham versus Florida. It's a 2010 case, which was not in the book by Bernard and Curlycheck. And in Graham versus Florida, in this case, the court ruled that a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole for juveniles convicted of non-homicide offenses constituted cruel and unusual punishment. Both of the above decisions are indications that the court is returning to the view that juveniles are not merely small versions of adults. This is due in part to advances in child and adolescent psychology, and juveniles are today regarded as having an underdeveloped lack of reasoning and being fundamentally different from adult criminals. Uh, Barry Feld also makes this point in the early chapters of his book. Um, this is also the primary line of reasoning that's relied upon by the Supreme Court in both the Roper case and the Graham case. Bernard and Curlycheck contend that we are starting to see a retreat from the Get Tough movement. In fact, they assert that the climax of the Get Tough movement was reached during the late 1990s. During the Get Tough Air, studies of juveniles tried in an adult court suggested that ju judges were often hesitant to place juveniles in adult incarceration settings. So there was a forced choice between imposing a severe punishment or doing nothing at all. Simply put, Get Tough policies provided an oversupply of harsh punishments and actually limited other choices for responding to delinquency. Fortunately, Bernard and Curlycheck argue that we are likely to see a return to more lenient treatments. They contend that this is not the first time that we have seen a reintroduction of lenient treatments. Um, rather, this is merely part of a cycle. One example of how leniency has been uh, reintroduced is reflected in the fact that several states have recently adopted reverse waivers. And reverse waivers are mechanisms for sending juveniles in the adult system back to the juvenile justice system. This is often done by a request from the defense attorney and the burden of proof is on the defense to prove that the youth is still amenable to treatment and should be returned to the juvenile justice system for processing. There is another indication, I think, that we are returning to lenient treatment. And this is due to the fact that prosecutors in at least some jurisdictions are declining to prosecute youths in criminal courts, even when required to do so by law. Um, for example, it is not uncommon for prosecutors to allow juveniles to plead to lesser offenses that do not require being transferred to the adult court. Also, according to Barry Feld, courts have held that a prosecutor cannot deliberately delay filing charges in order to allow a youth to age out of juvenile court jurisdiction. Um, that's obviously somewhat of a manipulative, manipulative uh, tactic by the prosecutor, and when this happens, the case is typically then transferred back to the juvenile court. Bernard and Curlycheck contend that police have also helped to provide leniency for uh, juvenile delinquents. The authors contend that the police handle up to 85% of the juveniles they encounter without arresting them. And the police may handle uh, cases of juvenile delinquency informal by calling the parents, 
maybe by giving the juveniles a warning or perhaps detaining the juvenile without filing a formal charge and then the parents have to come up to the station and pick the juvenile up and when police do file charges it is not uncommon for them to adjust the initial charge to avoid some of the harsher sanctions provided by the courts. For example, a police officer may charge a juvenile with simple assault rather than aggravated assault. And when charges are reduced, this does not trigger mandatory provisions which may require a juvenile to be transferred to an adult court. Finally, there is a strong indication that leniency has increased during di disposition hearings. Today, probation tends to be an outcome for juveniles much more so than residential placement. All of these trends illustrate that we are moving away from a get tough attitude and moving toward lenient treatments. And given the history of juvenile justice, Bernard and Curlycheck are not surprised by this and they argue that this could have been predicted by examining the historical cycle of the juvenile justice system. Bernard and Curlycheck also argue that we are likely to see a return to the medical model of treatment for delinquents relying more and more on treatment techniques from the fields of psychology and psychiatry, such as counseling, group therapy, and psychotropic medications in order to reform juvenile offenders. This is again consistent with Barry Feld, who argues that research has recently demonstrated that children think and act differently from adults. It is worth noting that the authors argue that it would be most helpful if we could address the underlying causes of delinquency by reforming society itself. For example, poor social and economic conditions uh, definitely give rise to juvenile delinquency. And if we could somehow change the stagnant urban ghettos, perhaps we could in some way reduce or at least lower uh, juvenile delinquency. The problem though, which I think is very interesting, the problem according to Bernard and Curlycheck is that if one criticizes the current economic system, well then this in some way may question the moral, moral and intellectual superiority of the criminal justice officials or social reformers. And history tells us that responses to delinquency that sell imply that there is nothing wrong with the economic system itself and rather the problem lies with the delinquent who is morally or intellectually inferior in some way. So given this we can expect to see officials focus their attention on the psychological problems of the juveniles as opposed to trying to rectify the realities of American society which include aspects such as segregation, economic inequality, and discrimination which are very conducive to the problem of juvenile delinquency and have been now for over 200 years.